Hi, I'm Kai, and welcome back to Kai's Wii Toolbox. It has been a little while since I last updated it, but that's because I spent the last few months working on a whole bunch of new features, and now I finally get to show them off. But before we get into that, there is a lot of new shortcuts that are very easy to forget, so I've listed them all in the modding menu right here. So if you ever forget anything, you can just look it up here. And just to quickly explain what this means, default is what the button does on its own, so just right click, or just pressing C, or just pressing K. And below that, you have a bunch of modifiers you can hold while pressing the button to change how it acts. Some functions, like this one down here, also have modes, and those can be combined with modifiers or just be used with a default button. But that'll become clearer as I show you a few examples. But let's start off with something simple. First of all, the damage tool. That's still here. You can heal stuff. You can break stuff. You can heal it again. Nothing's changed there. But then we have the movement tool. Press N to open it up, and then F into freeform mode, R into advanced rotation mode, and G into advanced movement mode. And all of these have changed completely. Kind of. The basics are still the same. So in freeform mode, you can click on something and move it. You can go into advanced rotation mode and rotate it. But they also come with some really cool new features. Let's start off with freeform mode. Just like before, you can click on something and it will follow your cursor. But unlike before, you can highlight objects by mousing over them. And if you select them, you can tell that you have them selected. And then some basic commands. Hold X to rotate around the X axis, Z to rotate around the Z axis, and Y to rotate around the Y axis. And like before, hold B to move the item up or down. Pressing C places the item on the ground. So I can move it up, press C, and it goes on the ground. And now we get into the fun stuff. First of all, pressing M pauses movement. And now you can shift click on items to add them to the group. So if I just click on something, that'll select that one item. But if I shift click, that'll add the item to the group. Or I can control click to deselect an item. So let's select a bunch of objects for the next example. Unpause with M. And now we can rotate them all together. Or move them all together. And now we can move them all where we want and confirm placement with left click. Or, if we're moving them around and we don't like where they are, we can cancel with right click. Now just like before, pressing C places items on the ground. But if I have a few items selected, pressing C will place the center of that selection on the ground. But if I press Ctrl C, that places the bottom of my selection on the ground. So that's C, Ctrl C. And if I hold shift while pressing C, that'll place all the items on the ground individually. And as you can see down here, you now have copy and paste height commands. Pressing K saves the height at the center of my selection. And then pressing L will load it. So if I press K, move the items up a little bit, and then press L, it'll load the last saved position, which was the center of my selection. And this is ground relative. So if I move the objects up and then go uphill and press L again, you see they load at the same exact height above the ground as they were down there. And like before, if I press Ctrl K, it'll save the bottom of my selection rather than the middle. That is to say, pressing Ctrl K saves the height of the lowest item in my selection. So if I now load with L, that'll move the center to what used to be the lowest item in my selection. Similarly, Ctrl L will move my selection by the lowest item in it rather than by the middle. So if I press K and then Ctrl L, that'll move the bottom of my selection to what used to be the middle. But all of this is ground relative, so if I save the height of my object here, then move it up a little bit, and load the height on a mountain, see it still loads on the ground. Now I imagine there will be some situations where you want to load objects at the exact same height you saved, not at the ground relative height. For that, you can hold Alt while you load them. So if I save here with K, move the object up, and then load with Alt L, you see it loaded at the exact same height I saved it, not at the ground relative height. So I can do Alt L, Alt L, Alt L. And one more thing I forgot to add is you can hold control to slow down movement. So this is rotating the item normally. And now with control, slow it down and then shift to speed it up. Likewise, I can move the item up normally and then control move and shift move. And I believe that covers freeform movement. So let's press G to switch into advanced movement mode. Advanced modes, that being advanced move and advanced rotate, offer less features than freeform, but they offer a lot more precision. So let's select a few rocks. So we can click, shift click, shift click, but you'll see they're selected in orange. If I move them, 
Now they're yellow. So yellow tells you if the item has been affected by movement. And this is used for a feature you can't really have in freeform mode. That being, if you right click with items affected by movement, they will reset without being deselected. So again, I can move them, right click to cancel. Move them again, right click to cancel. But if I right click with no objects being affected, that'll deselect the objects I had selected. So I can select them, move them, right click to cancel, right click to deselect. And like in freeform mode, I can move some items, left click to confirm, right click to deselect. Also like in freeform, I can affect the movement speed. So I can move them normally, control move, and shift move. And also, also, also like in freeform, I can press C to place the center of my selection on the ground and control C to place the bottom of my selection on the ground. However, unlike in freeform mode, copy copies the entire position of my items. So if I raise the items up a little bit and then press K, that copies the center of this position. If I now cancel out, select some new items and then press L, that'll place them at that last saved location. Control works like in freeform too, so Control K saves the bottom of my selection, and Control L loads to the bottom of my selection. But in this mode, Shift L will place all the selected items at the saved location. Let's select some more items, Shift L, and they're all placed together. And again, right click to cancel. And finally, pressing R takes us to advanced rotation mode. Same things apply, so we can click on items to select them, they highlight if you move them, right click to cancel, and left click to confirm. Space sets every object you selected to its default rotation, like so. Now loading and saving rotation is a little bit more complicated because you can't just add rotation simply, it's a whole formula to do it. So instead, loading and saving works on a per item basis. That is, if you have only one item selected, you're allowed to save that, and then you can select another item and load it to that rotation. You can also select multiple items and load them to that same saved rotation. You just cannot save multiple rotations at the same time. Now it's likely you noticed earlier that you can change modes without deselecting items. Now that also means that the unedited locations of each item are transferred between modes. So you can have movement, you can switch to freeform, move it around a little bit, rotate it around a little bit, switch back to advanced movement, move it a little bit, rotate it around a little bit again, and then cancel and it'll reset to the original position it had. Now, in my opinion, the fact that you can rotate something and then cancel, and then switch to movement, and then move it, and confirm without deselecting the object is a huge advantage of the advanced modes. Because as you saw, if I confirm placement, that deselects all items, and if I reselect and then move them in cancel placement, that also deselects all items. But you can achieve something similar in free move mode with a couple of tweaks. If you go into the modding menu, you'll see these two options here, deselect on confirm and deselect on cancel. You can disable both of these or mix and match however you like. So now if I move an object, let's just move it up and then cancel, that won't deselect it. Likewise, I can confirm placement without deselecting, but you can likely already see the issue. If I press cancel, the object goes down but it doesn't get deselected. I can cancel again, and it's still not deselected because it immediately moves my mouse cursor, so I can't exit out of the object. But there is a workaround, and that is to hold Alt down while you right click. So if I say confirm placement here, and then Alt right click, see that cancels and deselects the object at the same time. It is a bit more finicky if you're moving multiple items consecutively, but I do prefer working this way. Thankfully, the next tool is pretty straightforward. Press K to open up the environment tool. First, it lets you select time of day. So for it to say 1 p.m., 7 p.m., 6 a.m., and let's go back to day. Or you can set different weathers. So I believe clear is what we have right now. Make it overcast. Make it heavy rain. Make it kind of light snowy, heavy snowy, dust stormy. And what's really cool is a bunch of maps have their own clear settings. So this is this map's clear setting. It's the default one. But then we also have desert clear. It's kind of foggy. There's tiger clear. Just a bit more clean. Tiger clear too. A little bit greenish. 
Which is, is that more foggy or is that misty? I don't know which one's which. Temperate clear. Alpine clear. And tropical clear, which is just really fucking beautiful. Desert clear too, which is kind of green again. And biosyn clear, which is quite thick. And back to default. Which is the default weather for the map you have opened, by the way. Next up, a tool that is easy to use, but was deceptively difficult to program. Pressing L brings up the dinosaur spawn tool. As you see, you get a model of the dinosaur you'll be spawning. This is a real dinosaur, by the way, so you can say, go and smack things with it. But it does not have behaviors enabled. You can rotate it around a little bit. And we can use it to preview cosmetics. We can change the skin around, we can change the pattern around, use arrow keys for that as well. Just be aware that if you select a dinosaur in its upgrade, your arrow keys will switch to that. So you've got to click back down on the cosmetics to switch your arrow keys to that. Now most animals only have the one cosmetic set, but some, like the para, have multiples. Let's talk about that. Often when you switch cosmetic sets, you'll see the dinosaur turns black. That's because only the first cosmetic set has multiple skins and multiple patterns. Switch that back to one, and now you'll be able to properly preview all the other cosmetic sets. So as you can see, cosmetic sets aren't skins nor patterns. They're like a special model that some dinosaurs have. And I believe this is as many as the para has. Now I believe the dinosaur with the most cosmetic sets is the raptor. Again, fix the skin. And we can start previewing all its cosmetic sets. Or, of course, go back to the default set and have a look through the skins and patterns. One cool quality of life feature here is that the skins in that menu default to what skins you have selected for the dinosaur. So let's go into Baryonyx, modify genome, change the skins around, go for this radish one here, and this other one here, save and exit. And now, if we open up the tool and find Baryonyx, should be around here somewhere. Oh, that's right, he's a fisher, isn't he? Yep. And there we go, that's our skin. And as you saw there, it's broken up into different tabs. We have herbivores, piscivores, omnivores, carnivores, flyers, aquatics, and hybrids. And that finally brings us to the most complicated tool. If you press J, that will open up the dinosaur control tool. There's a bunch of different tabs here, and they're all very complicated, so let's just get into it. First up, the stats tab lets you set the stats of your dinosaur. So we can make it completely full or starving. Likewise, you can reset their stamina, make them want to hunt, make them want to be social, make them want to fight for the territory, or you can just set their health to zero. And lastly, we have their survival stats. That's a combination of their health, their stamina, their hunger, and their thirst. So setting that to maximum will set the dinosaur's health to maximum, hunger to maximum, stamina to maximum, and thirst to maximum. So far, so simple, but now it gets a bit more interesting. The next step over is the Dinosaur Command tab. With these commands, you can make dinosaurs go places, you can make them go eat at a certain place, or with these forced behaviors down here, you can force dinosaurs to perform certain behaviors indefinitely. So let me give you a few examples. Direct commands are all about making a dinosaur go somewhere and do something. So with travel to, I can click on a para, click here on a map, and the dinosaur will now travel there. and it went to sleep because I interrupted its current behavior. You'll see this happen quite a bit. You can also click on a dinosaur, shift click another dinosaur, and then left click to tell them where to go, and they'll both head there. Or you can make a dinosaur go somewhere and drink. So if I click on the Serato and then click here next to the water, it'll travel there and then drink. And it looks like it was already pretty full. And now for a more interesting example, let's make this para go and eat from this here meat feeder. Speed it up because it's already pretty far. Come on. And there we go. And just like the Serato, it looks like it's pretty full and it won't eat. 
But we can fix that. Let's make it really hungry. And now, let's make it eat from the feeder again. And there you go. Had a proper meal this time. So you can do that with meat, you can do that with fish, you can do that with low herbivore food. Let's do that actually. Let's make a serato. And this friend, go and eat some herby food. And again, we saw them eating from the feeder seconds ago, so they're pretty full, but they did try. And the last one here is eat from feeder. Very similar to eat meat, but I'll be using it for some custom diets later on. And that brings us to partnered commands. We have fight dominance, fight normal hunt, and fight void hunt. I wouldn't really bother with the fight void hunt. It's very similar to fight normal hunt with a couple of tweaks, but it is useful for debugging behaviors. So let's make the Serato hunt this para. And now with that queued, we're going to, there we go. We're going for it. And of course I missed the kill, but the point stands. And of course you can make the para hunt the Serato as well. There they go, and there goes the Serato. And I can't really show off dominance because my Serato is dead, so let me just get another one. I believe it's uh, somewhere... There it is. So now if I select this Serato here and make it target this one here, they're going to have a dominance fight, provided that the space between them is empty. If it's in a forest or in water or otherwise obstructed, they might not be able to fight there. And I guess that's that settled. And that finally brings us to forced behaviors. With this you can make dinosaurs pursue certain needs, even if they don't need to. So if I make this dinosaur thirsty, it'll now go and drink indefinitely. It can have breaks, but it will always come back to drinking afterwards. But with this handy little reset switch, I can make it go back to normal. But those are all pretty simple, so I'm not going to cover them all individually. What I will do is move on to these delay and duration sliders. Now, duration acts a little bit different depending on what command you pair it with, but delay acts the same. It just delays the command by a certain amount of time, and it goes from 0 to 120 seconds. And the duration goes from 1 second to 120 seconds. So, I'm sure you recall, that if I tell a dinosaur to travel somewhere, it'll travel until it gets there. But, if I add a duration to that travel command, that'll act as a maximum timer. After that timer, the dinosaur will give up. So, let's tell the Serato to travel very far on a tight timer. You see it gets up, travels a little bit, and then it gives up. And again, the dinosaur will start moving, walk a little bit, and then give up part way there. This works the same for fights, so if you tell one dinosaur to hunt another, and the timer runs out, they'll stop hunting. But it works a little bit different for forced behaviors. If you remember, with a timer of zero, the dinosaur will go and perform that behavior forever. So if I make the dinosaur thirsty, as soon as it's full, it'll go and it'll drink indefinitely. But if I make the dinosaur drink with a duration timeout, it'll drink for a while until that timer runs out, and then it'll stop. The delay is a little bit simpler, and it just delays the command by however long you set it to. So if I set it to one minute, and then tell the dinosaur to travel, the dinosaur won't travel until a minute has passed since I sent the command. And there we go. But there is one more thing you can do with this. As you can see here, you can hold Alt to add the command to a queue. So if I click on this dinosaur and tell it to travel, and then hold Alt and tell it to travel somewhere else, and then hold Alt to tell it to travel somewhere else, then all these commands will be added to a queue, and the dinosaur will do them one after the other. And this can get quite complex, so I can tell the Serato to travel here, and then here, and then add a delay, and tell it to eat something. So now the Serato will travel to the first point, then to the second point, and now it'll just sort of chill for a while, and then it'll come back and eat. After about a minute, so it's going to be a little while. And there we go. See, so it's stopping and comes back, and it stops and comes back. 
because it's now forced to prioritize eating even though it's not hungry. But I think we've tormented it enough, let's let it loose. But whereas alt clicking adds to a queue, regular clicking deletes the queue and overrides commands. So if I tell this dinosaur to travel here, and then alt click and tell it to travel here, while it's moving I can click here and that'll interrupt it. So again, alt to add to queue, or regular click to clear the queue and make it do something right now. And with that, I think we can move on to the animations. Now the first animations are moods, and they're a little bit tricky to show off because they only affect the dinosaur's posture while it's walking. I set it to aggressive. Can't really see much right now. You'll see it's kind of fight posing every now and again. Ah, there you go, see? It kind of dips down to his regular dominance fight position. There it goes again, and it starts drinking again. If I make it sick, that kind of makes it a little bit more floppy. Oh, hold on, I think this is the Sriracha I made drink earlier and forgot to reset it. Let me just, uh, fix it up real quick. There we go. So yeah, it's a bit floppy, but it's very hard to tell. Next one's pretty simple, it's just Ragdoll. And Ragdoll off. We can apply it with a delay as well. Just see how that looks. Any minute now. <laughs> and there it goes. Come on, get up. Come on, come on, there we go. And that brings us to actions. So actions are repeated animations that the dinosaur can perform either indefinitely or for a set time. So, say for example, we wanted to make this para sleep. We can now select sleep, click on it, and it'll sleep pretty much forever. Or we want to make it eat. We click on eat, click on a dinosaur, and it'll start eating where it is. Same for drinking. Same for preening. Same for attacking fences. And idle. And now we can set it free. And just like before, we can cue these. So say if we... I'm just trying to find one that isn't eating or doing anything right now. Ah, there we go. You'll do. Let's just set a duration on that. And then make you eat for a while. And drink for a while. Then... See, for a while? Uh, actually, no. Attack fences for a while. And that should be it. You can see it's eating. Now it's drinking. Now it's attacking fences. And it's done. And then finally we have triggers. There's not too many of them, they're sort of one of things, but let's show them off anyway. So let's find a dinosaur that can roar for us. Oh, they're done. There we go. Roar for me. Or again. And of course we can add delays to this. There we go. Let's get Squawk from the little guy. Hey, that's a good Squawk. Give us another. Hey. <laughs> then we just have some dart reactions. That's hitting from the left, hitting from the right, hitting in the head from the left, head right, tail left, and tail right. There you go, you can see a little wobble there. The head's usually a bit easier to see. Yeah, see, that's way more clear. Yeah, it's not the most dramatic thing, but I think it comes across a bit clearer on smaller animals. And with that, we can move on to the cosmetic stool. Similar to the dinosaur spawner, you have the cosmetic set, the skin, and the pattern. And you can cycle through them. So to cycle, you select a dinosaur and just click on it. And alt-click to go back. 
a bit easier to see with this. Going forward, going back. You can also copy a cosmetic and paste it on another dinosaur of the same species. You can also, of course, cycle cosmetic sets, but Serratos only have the one. So let me find a different dinosaur real quick. Ah, power will be perfect. So like I said, you can cycle cosmetic sets, but you will need to respawn the dinosaur to do this. And again, alt to go back. One thing to keep in mind is changing the skin or pattern is purely visual. So if you save and load the game, those changes will be gone. But don't worry, there is a way to make this permanent. All you gotta do is click on the respawn button, respawn the dinosaur, and there you go. That will now be permanent. You can save and load the game and the changes will stay. But if you're changing a whole bunch of dinosaurs, it can be hard to keep track of which ones to respawn. And that's what this setting is for. If you set it to on, now you can go ahead and change whichever dinosaurs you want to. As soon as you close the tool, the modified dinosaurs will be forced to respawn with their new skins, and that'll be permanent. And that finally brings us on to the last two tabs, diseases and injuries. And these are pretty self-explanatory. Select a disease, apply it to a dinosaur, and it'll have the disease. Select a different disease, apply it to a different dinosaur, and it'll have that disease. Select cure disease, and you can cure dinosaurs of diseases. Same thing goes for injuries. Select injuries, apply them, select cure injuries, cure them. Speaking of injuries, you can now apply scarring to dinosaurs using these scars. This lets you apply scars to dinosaurs without the negative effects that injuries come with. And that is also what this checkbox down here is all about. If combat injuries are disabled, then even very serious injuries will not scar dinosaurs. If you want to scar a dinosaur, you need to enable combat injuries. Just one more thing to mention is that the mod uses two different queue systems. There are commands, which are things dinosaurs are actively doing, and then there are events, which are things that happen to dinosaurs once, and then they're over. So with that in mind, this entire menu is commands. All of these subheadings are all commands, as are actions, because they're something the dinosaur is constantly doing. However, moods, toggles, triggers, diseases, and injuries are all events. So that means they are all added to a different queue than commands. The reason for this is so that you can queue certain things at the same time. So we can, for example, make a dinosaur walk somewhere, and at the same time, a dart can hit it, or it can get a disease, or it can fall over, or something like that. So thanks to the separate command and action queues, you can queue certain things to happen at the same time. So with all that said, let me quickly cover how the grouping and selection system works. Any commands that require two clicks, so say, click to select, click to move, you can instead hold shift to add animals to your selection, and then the next regular click will apply the command to all those animals. And you can, of course, hold control to deselect animals as well. But anything that is instant, so say behaviors or stats, that doesn't work with selection or groups, that is just click to apply. But there is still a way to highlight multiple animals at once, and that is using either the group or the park modifiers. So if I mouse over this serrato, it only highlights that one serrato. But if I hold Z, it highlights all the serratos in its group. And the same applies to all animals you do this to. For example, these two struthies. Or you can hold down X while mousing over, and that'll highlight every animal in the park. Or you can hold down X and Z at the same time to select every animal from the species in the park. Here, for example, I'm highlighting two raptors in this enclosure and one raptor in the other enclosure. And of course, this applies to these tools as well. So I can select animals individually, like so. Or I can hold Z to select both of them in this enclosure. Or I can hold X to select everything in the park. Or I can hold X and Z to select all raptors in the park. Now please bear with me because the next feature requires a whole bunch of dryos to demonstrate properly. Now if we just go into the movement tool and select all these dryos, if we teleport them into one spot, they'll all end up on the exact same point. Ignore the others, they're just not ready for teleporting right now, they're busy with some other behavior. But if we hold the group key, that being Z, while we teleport them, they'll end up in a nice little circle. Or in fact, they'll end up in consecutively growing circles. Now this works for all travel commands, and it's ideal for migrations. Because it's a much more believable travel pattern. See, they all travel side by side, rather than all trying to coalesce on one point.
And one last thing to add is that the scale of both the delay and the duration are customizable within the modding menu. You can set the maximum delay and duration anywhere between 1 and 300 seconds. And you can set the amount of subdivisions between the minimum and maximum numbers. But as you can see here, the maximums can be set at any point, but changing the amount of subdivisions requires you reload the map. Now one thing I forgot to mention here is this is a very complicated tool and it messes with a lot of dinosaur behavior, so it's very possible that at some point, if you just time things wrong or cue things the wrong way, you might break dinosaur behavior. But thankfully, that's very easy to fix. You can just save the game, go back into the main menu, load back into the game, and everything should be fine. And that, I believe, finally covers the mod. I've been speaking like this for about six hours now, so I'm going to go take a break. I hope you enjoyed it, I hope you found it useful. I hope you enjoy the mod when it's out. Thank you very much for listening and watching.